Hi and welcome to Art Tip Tuesday. Welcome to my channel. I'm Sam and I'm a pet portrait and wildlife artist and my aim is to help other pencil artists to grow in skills and confidence and to feel the benefits that regular creative practice has on health and well-being. So today we're going to talk about the three biggest mistakes that I see and have done myself uh, when trying to create realistic fur. I was going to do five but I thought why overwhelm you? Um, and I think a lot of the time when we look at something and we all we see, well, especially when it's our own work, all, all we see is lots of mistakes. Actually, we can become overwhelmed and disheartened and then it doesn't really want to make you continue. So I thought if I just break it down to the three biggest ones that I've seen and done and continue to try and improve on and work on, then I think um, even if you pick one of them, you might not have all of them, but if you pick one of them that you think could make a difference to your artwork, then um, I'm, I would be really pleased about that. So the first mistake that I see quite regularly, and I know that in the past, this is the one that I really struggled with, and it was just not enough layers. And I know you hear this all the time. Pencil artists are constantly saying layers, 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 but how many layers to put down and what does layering actually mean? Well, the way I look at it is that if you're trying to create something that looks realistic, you kind of need to think about the anatomy of what it is you're actually drawing. So if, you, if you've got a pet, then great, or you can kind of look at your own head of hair you've got um, your base colours which are made up or your sculpt, the skin, it's actually made up of lots of different colours. So it's not just one layer of like a pinky colour or a, or a kind of an ochre colour or a burnt sienna, something like that. There could be lots of different greys and browns and yellows and pinks and blues incorporated within the skin. So even that layer needs building up. You wouldn't just make skin one colour. You know when you were a child and you just had one colour pink in your pencil box and they always look really, really kind of, um, I don't know, cerise or something, really bright. So I tend to try and break it down into that. So if you're drawing skin, go with the lightest colour that you can possibly see. And if in doubt, use something like an ivory or a cold grey one or a warm grey one. Can't really go wrong with that. And I'm kind of talking about animal fur here um, more than you know skin tones but obviously they have a layer of skin and then start to think about what are the lightest colors in the fur that you can see and again there are probably lots of different colors if you really observe your reference photo if you really look hard at it and maybe step back and then look again you'll start to notice more and more colors are coming through and so you try to start to get a bit of an indication as to how many colors you might actually need to create this fur to create all of the different lovely tones and slight differences within the fur so with coloured pencils, as you probably know, you have to work from light to dark and um, with the other more subtle highlights and um, that fade into the darkest shadows, there's probably quite a lot of colours that go on there. There's lots of yellows and creams and um, browns and the, the Faber-Castell are brilliant for this because you can work up through the lovely brown tone. So through the ochres and then you've got the umbers and then you've got the lovely nugget and the bister and you've got the burnt sienna, which has some red tones to it. And then you've got the Van Dyke brown, the walnut brown, lovely, beautiful, natural colours. Um, and then you've got all of the warm greys, the cold greys, and you've got the dark sepia. So you can start to get a sense of how many layers it might take. Uh, as a general rule, I'd probably say, you know, 20 plus. Uh, if it's a lighter animal, you're going to have less. If it's a darker animal, you need to build up through the, the tones and it's going to be more. For example, I'll just show you this, this lion. Um, I think there's probably, and I'm nowhere near finished, I still need to glaze over the top and I still need to add a little bit of depth, but you can see how many different colours go into just what you'd class as like a, a kind of golden mane. So if in doubt, add more layers <laughs> and you'll find that um, you'll start to create a thick, soft, a fur that you could possibly imagine, you know, stroking running your fingers through your cat, your dog doesn't have just a couple of your hair, it, in fact, doesn't just have two, three layers of, of fur. It's built up of lots and lots of different layers, lots and lots of pencil strokes. 
and lots of different colors. That leads me to my next point, my next main, number two, is softening the pencil strokes. Now, a lot of people have said to me, how do you get it to look softer and not look so kind of pencil-y and grainy and that kind of thing? So what I tend to suggest is that as you layer, you will naturally start to see that the fur is starting to soften, but you can also go over not each layer but every now and again once you've got a few colors down with a lighter pencil and i tend to use maybe a luminance a soft pencil in a uh, the buff titanium or some of the ochres or even the siennas the the luminance pencils are brilliant because they've got those percentages so i'll tend to go over the top with a lighter pencil that i'm using and what that does is it tends to soften the pencil strokes so it, it it kind of moves the pigment around a little bit so that it blurs the edges slightly and then you get a much softer look and it also helps to get rid of graininess as well now there is an element of graininess or texture which is really important with fur but i tend to leave the final layers for the detail where the pencil strokes are starting to show through you can also use something like this which is a colorless pencil blender by karen dash so you're not going to put any colour on top with the whiter or the lighter colours. You've got to be a little bit mindful that it could knock out the colour underneath a little bit too much. So a very light hand and if in doubt and if you're worried about picking the colour and not, not wanting to get it wrong, then use a colourless pencil blender like this. You can also use solvent, which a lot of people do use. The, um, the only one I've ever used is the Zestit pencil blend, which has like a, an orangey. Uh, just be a little bit careful that you don't put too much on. Really dab your brush on a bit of tissue or, or a tea towel so that you're not putting it too much on your work because you're sometimes left with a bit of oily residue and actually you do need quite a lot of layers down before you even think about adding the solvent but it is there as an option and it is a good option just be a little bit careful about how much you use the next point that um, is really i think something that once you get to the end of your portrait you've been probably putting quite a few hours into it and you start to <laughs> you start to look at it and think oh, God, i don't know if I can look at this reference photo anymore and, I'm, and you start to not really see you're not observing as much you're possibly getting a little bit frustrated or fed up <laughs> I've been there myself that's why I'm laughing but um so I can understand when you get to the end of which just want it finished you just want it done but I really recommend going in for another half an hour an hour and adding the shadows and really thinking about adding some depth. If you've got um, a shadowed part, which is really dark, and then you've got a highlight next to it, you've usually got some kind of mid, mid highlight, mid shadow, or, or a, a slight variation into the shadow, which creates more of a rounded form. So you've got your highlight and then it blends into the shadow. It's not just kind of butting shadow and highlight. You do get that sometimes. There's always an exception to the rule, but Think about, are your shadows as dark as they need to be? In which case you can glaze over the top. And I always recommend something like, looking for it, um, my dark sepia in the Faber-Castell or the warm grey six is a really good one. Or you can use um, a lovely colour. The Pablos are great for this. The Granite Rose always springs to mind. Um, the Cinnamon or Chestnuts are having a really lovely bright colour that just makes it pop. Adding these final details with a little bit of a pop of colour or a shadow or a glaze over the top really makes the drawing pop out. That also leads me a little bit to a, a point number four, which is kind of your flyaways and your highlights and your last details. Please spend a little bit of time, possibly with the slice tool. I've got a video on how to use that and I imagine you could find lots of them on YouTube. It's a really amazing tool. If you haven't got one, you can use a craft knife um, just as easily. Just be a little bit careful. The slice is so much better for someone who's quite clumsy like me. But you can just slice away some of the finer hairs, the flyaway hairs, so that it doesn't look too uniform and it looks a lot more realistic. There's always a hair that comes out of place and all of these little imperfections are what make things look more realistic. If you would like a free guide, completely free, I've done a PDF on how to make your drawings look 
more realistic and I'm going to put that in the description box you can just um, download it it's a pdf for you to read through at your leisure and I really hope that helps it's actually five points to make your drawings more realistic but I've incorporated most of these and I really hope you will find it helpful if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more please don't forget to like and subscribe and to press that bell icon so you're notified of future videos and if you would like a little bit more of a step-by-step -step approach to drawing tutorials I do have two memberships that I will link in the description box as well which has a library a growing library of tutorials on different subjects for florals botanicals lots of different things to kind of get your teeth into great projects for you to do on a much more real-time step-by-step basis I talk as I draw so you're having all of my thought process behind it um, I will put those links in the description for more information and I really look forward to seeing you next time bye for now